Uh, hi everybody, it's great uh, to have Roikel from the IAS. He worked on uh, many things in the randomization and pseudo randomness and complexity theory. And uh, today we'll talk uh, only about the new directions. We also <laughs> worked on old things. Thanks a lot, Ryan. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. So, as Ryan said, my name is Roikel. And this talk is titled New Directions in Randomization, Non-Black Box Techniques, and Superfast Algorithms. And the backdrop for the talk is that there's been a fast-paced progress in the area in the last two or three years, with new ways of thinking, with uh, new technical paradigms, and with new questions that are interesting and that are motivating most of the research. And my original intention was to survey this progress. And this is the abstract that I sent, but I kind of changed my mind. So I will want to focus this talk on one result from a recent paper. It would be nice because we're going to be able to see a proof or proof sketch. Uh, the recent paper is with uh, Lydia Chen from Stalin uh, Berkeley. It's over there, which much of my work on this subject was done together with him. And the plan for what I'm going to do is the following. So this is my compromise. I'm going to start by first rushing very quickly over the entire survey background for everything that's happened in the last two or two and a half years, which means that I'm going to survey in very high level the new directions in this area. The first one is going to be non-black box version of the classical hardness versus randomness framework. The second one is a question of super fast algorithms, algorithms with optimal runtime overhead, and the question of whether we can get free lunch theorems in randomization. And then I'm going to focus the second half of the talk on one particular result, which is a free lunch theorem for de-randomizing interactive proof system. And I'm going to have one teaser here for a result that we'll see, which is an NP-type argument system. So an NP-type is just a proof or sense message and the verifier checks it deterministically that counts the number of solutions for a given SAT formula in time two to the epsilon n, where epsilon can be as small as you want. We're going to, show, to see this formula. Please feel free to interrupt to interrupt me. It's nicer for me that way. So don't hesitate. So okay, we'll start with the background, which is the new directions. I'm going to first talk about non-black box techniques, which do the randomization while avoiding the classical paradigm of PRGs. So hardness versus randomness. I'm assuming that most, if not all of you, have heard of it. This is the main paradigm in the area of randomization. It started in the early 80s and then crystallized into what we know today in every textbook, in every complexity one-on-one -on -one course, one -on -one course in the late 80s and early 90s. And it, it continued to develop. There are actually even a couple of questions that are still open and really interesting here. So it's still being developed. But most of what we know is from the early 90s and late 80s. Sorry, there was a question. No, my bad. So just, you know, to be on the same page, remind everyone what we're talking about. This classical paradigm talks about PRGs. PRG is an algorithm that, wait, I should probably do something like, oh, this is better, right? Great, so a PRG is an efficient algorithm that takes a short, truly random seed and stretches it to a long sequence of bits. And the long sequence of bits is pseudo-random. And what do we mean by pseudo-random? It's not that it's, uh, it fools like a subset of statistical tests that we thought of in advance. This is theoretically pseudo-random. It's resilient against any efficient observer, including ones we haven't thought about. This is the modern notion of PRGs from the 80s. And it allows us, in the context of de-randomization, to replace the random bits by pseudo-random bits. So effectively, we shrunk the number of truly random bits that we need from the length of the random string here on the right, let's see if it's ah, from the length of the random string, which is now pseudo-random, to the length of the C, which is short. The good setting to keep in mind, the classical one, is if we want to generate n pseudo random bits, we might want to ideally get a seed that is logarithmic in its language. So it's so short that we can just enumerate over it. And this is how we do the randomization. We open up a Goldrex textbook or a Malak textbook, this is what we see. And the main focus in this classical line of works is proving an equivalence. This is total characterization. The equivalence is between so lower bounds for non-uniform circuits, so explicit functions are hard for non-uniform circuits, and PRGs for non-uniform circuits. 
And then we're going to use these PRGs for non-uniform circuits for the randomizing. For example, for showing that BBP equals B. And it's a good point to just stop for like a second and point at something weird. I'm not sure how many people have this uh, well in mind. Like, okay, why do we need a PRG for circuits if we just want to randomize BBP? I'm gonna give a second. I, it's weird. So far, I, I talked about randomization of algorithms, and now I'm talking about an equivalence between lower bounds for circuits and PRGs for circuits. I inserted the notion of non uniformity into the conversation under the rug without explaining. So, when we want to de randomize algorithms, we're taking an algorithm and we're all, also taking an input, right? We want to simulate a probabilistic algorithm on a given input. And that input could give some kind of auxiliary advice to the algorithm. Which helps it break the PRG. So the actual distinguisher, the adversary, the observer that we have in mind is not just a uniform algorithm, it's an algorithm coupled with advice, which gives a circuit. Okay, so just uh, as the canonical example for this classical equivalence, this is a result of Impagliazzo and Peterson from 97. So exponential time is hard for, exponent for circuits of smaller exponential size, if and only if there are PRGs just like the one we saw. So efficient polynomial time with the logarithms. And to parse, this is on the left, a lower bound for circuits. It says that if you take arbitrary functions in exponential time, you cannot uh, speed up their computation in general just by using non-uniformity. Non-uniformity can't help you just speed up every exponential time function. And on the right, this is the PRG that we need. And as a consequence of that, a byproduct of having this PRG, you get that BBP equals P. We use the PRG for the randomization just like I just mentioned. I'm going to be a bit informal. BPP and P in this talk are the promise problem versions. If you're not sure what I mean, it's a technicality. This is the version that's usually studied. And it's a classical open question of whether we really need this. The PRGs yield the black box type of the randomization. Right? We have one PRG that's good for all circuits, so it's good for all algorithms. One so the random set. And we don't even look at the code of the algorithm when generating this uh, set. And starting in the early 2000s, the question of whether or not this is an overkill has been studied. Uh, we know today from the last decade that actually for, no, for non-deterministic randomization, MA equals NP type of stuff, the black box approach is necessary. You need to use PRGs. This is a key step in Ryan Williams' algorithm. algorithm. But for the classical setting of BPP equals P, the question of whether or not we really need black box randomization is wide open. There's been no unconditional progress on this question for two decades. Okay, so let's dive in a bit, okay? How do we do the randomization in complexity one-on-one -on -one or in any textbook? So we start with a complete problem. The complete problem is as follows. We get as input a description of a circuit C. It has one output bit. And we want to approximate its acceptance probability up to some small additive error. Of course, we could just sample inputs for this circuit and get a good approximation and do it randomly, but we want to do it deterministic. This is the cut problem. So this is the challenge that we're trying to solve. And when using the classical method of PRGs and lower bounds for circuits, what we do in order to solve this is the first step is that we write down the truth table of a function that's hard for all circuits. How do we have such a function? Well, that's our assumption, right? We're assuming lower bounds for circuits. So we just write down this function, which is explicitly computable. And now we invoke a transformation of this hard truth table into a set of pseudo random strings. This is Nissan Vigerson type of stuff. We know other kinds of transformations. It, it uses uh, technical tools that you know our correcting codes, polynomials, combinatorial designs, hash functions. There are several, several families of transformations. They're known, they're classical, so they allow us to map this function into a pseudorandom set. And in the end, we evaluate the circuit of the pseudorandom set and we output the majority. But the circuit should behave <clears throat> just the same as it behaves on a truly random string. And the classical analysis shows that if the function is hard, then this works, it fools the circuit. And of course, when you look at it, the first thing you notice is that it's really annoying. This makes no sense. <laughs> we had a circuit on our heads, the circuit C. And the first thing that we did in this algorithm is to completely forget about it 
and then just write down from thin air, from the heavens, from our heads, a truth table that is hard for our servants. And the new approach is based on this natural and simple idea of <clears throat> instead of writing down this truth table from thin air, producing it from the input C. So we're going to do pretty much the same thing that we did before, except that instead of writing a string that is the truth table of a hard function in respect of, of C, we're going to write down a string that is a function of the input C. And then apply this kind of classical style transformations of the string to solve random sets. And the key point here is that we're using information from the input circuit C to produce pseudo randomness that works only for this particular circuit C. I'm pausing for a second. Is this point clear? Are there any questions? Overly clear or overly unclear? This is like when there's silence, it's one of the two options. I see some notes. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Oh, well, I haven't said anything about what this function is yet, yeah. right? So earlier, this was a truth table. So it was a function that, you know, this is the truth table of the function. Now it's just some transformation. And of course, I'm going, this algorithm, I want it to run in efficient, efficiently and deterministically. So of course, this is going to be a way to efficiently and deterministically transform C into this string. But I haven't said what the properties of this are because in every result it's different. Uh, I'm just thinking that if then you have a like you can see also as a follow of course we're going to make some assumptions on this. Okay. So, uh, I'm just thinking that uh, it would be uh, hurt. Of course, we're going to see it in a couple of slides, but of course, that's the main point, right? Right, good. <coughs> okay, so going back to the previous picture of a PRG, earlier the PRG took a short random seed and stretched it. Now this is uh, what we call a targeted PRG. It takes a short random seed and a description of an observer, and it produces a long sequence of pseudo-random bits that are pseudo-random only to this specific observer. And actually this object was defined about 12 years ago by Goldrach. And uh, this is exactly the object that you just saw. And the point is exactly as you now asked, we're going to get the randomization from inherently weaker assumptions that avoid circuit lower bounds and only discuss lower bounds for Turing machine for uniform algorithms. And they're seemingly the right type of assumptions. These are lower bounds for probabilistic Turing machines. And this, uh, I'm, I'm really hand wavy because this is, this is just the background, but it yields a new framework for other source values. It's robust to perturbations in the assumption. You get the same perturbation in the conclusion. It scales quantitatively in all directions. You can extend it to proof systems, to small space, to parallel algorithms. It works just as well as the original framework. And you know, this idea of using the input to produce randomness for the input, it's not radical. It's the first thing that you try. Right? It's, not, it's not something crazy. And it has been tried for several decades. There has been one successful line of works initiated by Golarch and Binderson 20 years ago. But this uh, kind of framework is completely new. It's inherently different from the previous attempts. And it gets much stronger results from weaker assumptions. So this is uh, the new so idea. Yeah. Well, we, I'm, I'm going to get to that in exactly two slides. Okay, so of course, to materialize, I, I said people have been trying to do this. So to materialize this now, we're going to need some creative ideas. And there have been several new creative ideas in the last several years. So what is this function f, you asked? So for example, it could be, the string could be a direct product of a hard function on the substrings of the input. Or it could be, think of f as a hard function, but take this string to be the computational history of the hard function, which would also be good. Or again, f could be a hard function and take this string to be the prover strategies in a doubly efficient proof system that asserts this value. So go wild. There's lots of things you can do here. You, you don't have to just uh, stick to the old way of just evaluating the hard function. Okay, and this goes to your question right now. So the focal point of uh, studying this non black box type of randomization is the following. So we knew that lower bounds for circuits are equivalent to PRGs for circuits. And we are now looking to see what are the right hypotheses 
for a statement that characterizes the statement BPP equals P, promise BPP equals promise. Trying to characterize the randomization and understand it because it's equivalent to something, just not, we, we don't know at the moment that it's equivalent to circuit level bounds. And uh, there's been a sequence of recent results. There have been several equivalences proved, already published, another equivalence that strengthens and generalizes them coming up. But there is uh, one natural major conjecture from a paper of Fiji and mine from a year and a half ago that uh, got a lot of attention and still unproved. I really like it. It's like a natural characterization. It's, it's a thing that you like and like you automatically believe that it's true. We, we got two implications, but we're not there yet. So the question of characterizing BPP equals P is the focal point here. There are partial results, but there's still a lot of work to do. So it's a major conjecture. This is one direction. The other direction is a question of super fast algorithms and free lunch theorems. So going back to classical results, the ones that we just saw, they say that, okay, in the conclusion, we have that BPP equals P, which implies that for any time bound T, you can simulate <coughs> probabilistic time T in deterministic time T to the C, where C is a constant. We're not necessarily controlling this constant. It comes from the hypothesis and you add a lot of overheads construction. So, okay, maybe T goes to T to the million, but we're happy, right? In the 90s, oh, polynomial time, perfect. We solved the question. So of course, it's been 30 years and we really care about this constant C at this point. So a great question from a couple of years ago raised by the Ron Moshkovitz Hohen Superman is can we de-randomize faster? <coughs> What's the actual cost of removing randomness? How much do you have to pay? So if you start with time T, you need to go to T to the hundred, to T to the 10, which is smaller, but still like completely impractical, to T squared, which like tickles the border of whether or not this is practical, right? quadratic time algorithm. And note that this is a question about fine-grained polynomial complexity of the type that's been studied in the last decade or bit more. And you look at this, and what comes to mind, of course, is, okay, can we get C to be one? Can we get a free lunch? Can we de-randomize time, probabilistic time T in deterministic time of it? It sounds a bit crazy today. And if you are writing your thesis on randomization and you're going back to 1977 to go and look at the original DPP paper, it turns out that there's an, it's an anecdote, but it was conjectured at the time. The first paper that defined it raised a conjecture which is stronger than what we even think is believable today, is uh, provable today. So, okay, can we de randomize without paying for it? And I just talked a lot about non black box randomization and the connection between the two directions that we're going to use non-black box randomization techniques to get this type of super fast randomization algorithms. In many cases, it's necessary. You can prove that no PRG can get the results that you can get without PRGs. You don't have to pass this. This is uh, just a, a quick survey of results from the last couple of years. And I want you to mostly look at this like, uh, here is the conclusion and on the right, in gray, there's the hypothesis, because I don't want you to parse it because it's complicated and messy at the, at the moment. But the point is that, okay, whatever you put in in terms of hypothesis, you get the corresponding conclusion. And in some cases, we have several different hypotheses to choose from. Um, this started, the, it looked very ad hoc a couple of years ago, but now it's starting to look like a theory because you can trade off stuff and you have several different possibilities. So you can de-randomize time t and t to the three, de-randomizing de quadratic time, and you can even de-randomize where time t goes to t multi multiplied by n, the input length. So if t is like a huge polynomial, you don't really feel it. This is very fast randomization. If you want to de-randomize de linear time, you're suffering the quadratic loss here, right? n goes to n squared. So you really feel it for smaller time bounds. And under assumptions, this is unavoidable. You must pay this multiplicative overhead. So this is a sequence of results that gets the randomization and gets it all the way up to paying some multiplicative thing in the input. Right? And I've been promising you free lunch theorems, right? This does not look like a free lunch. So the free lunch result, which again, this is a <coughs> so I'm not going to state it formally. So under a natural assumption, it's a, this kind of direct product hypothesis, it's quite believable. We can simulate probabilistic time t in deterministic time very close to t. It's n to the little o of one, so it's really negligible. 
but think of it as t to the one plus epsilon if you wish. And okay, this randomization will have some errors. It's not a perfect worst case one, but no efficient algorithm can find these errors except with negligible probability. So you think of this as an effective the randomization in the sense that no efficient observer can detect the difference of the randomization of the original part. Uh, you can think of it as a lunch that looks free. It's not really a free lunch. There are errors, but nobody can find these errors. And this, this type of results is what we're going to see when we're reaching the randomization that has no overhead whatsoever. And it's quite crazy when you look at it. We, we, we really remove the randomness here and pay nothing. At least nothing that anyone can detect. Uh, is it yeah, possible? The <laughs> yeah, the assumption is completely uniform. No, in, in terms of uh, so now it's a circuit that's uh, it's, it's a program. Yeah. And it has an effective input or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not a non-uniform advice. No, there are no PRGs here. This thing has does not talk of it's non-black box, meaning that if there is a probabilistic algorithm and it gets an input. And we want to simulate it, right? We are just using the information from the input without this type of classical non-uniform circuit stuff. But the input also comes from an efficient program. If I input yeah, input precisely, <laughs> precisely, precisely. So there's no, you kill the non-uniform advice. Exactly, and this is precisely why you avoid this. Perfect. Any other questions? Thanks for closing the door. Okay, of course, this requires non black box techniques. You probably cannot do such a thing in the future. So let's see how we are with time. We're great with time. This was the background. I know that it was a bit rushed and very hand wavy. I won't mention the results in detail. My goal was to get here. Uh, but again, feel free to slow me down, stop me and ask questions. I'm going to be a bit more orderly from now on. So what I want to show is one result from a recent paper that talks about a free lunch type of randomization for pool systems. And the main corollary, it's the most striking special case, is the following. So under a plausible assumption that I promise that we'll see, for every constant epsilon that is as small as you want, there's a deterministic verifier V that does the following. The verifier gets as input a formula phi. Think of it as a phi is of, of polynomial size first. Okay, it can be larger, but it doesn't matter. The verifier gets an n bit formula of standard size. It runs in time two to the epsilon n, <coughs> so two to the n over a million, and it satisfies the following two conditions. There exists a proof, even an efficiently producible proof, that makes the verifier print the precise number of satisfying assignments for this formula. And in terms of soundness, for every efficient adversary, where efficient here means exponential time, but we're disallowing that double exponential time, that will be fair. So for every efficient adversary, the probability that the adversary manages to fool the verifier is time, two to the minus little omega of n. Where fooling the verifier means producing a formula and the proof that make the very make the very far output an incorrect count. So uh, let's let's parse parse this in context. So recall that we have exponential type hypothesis for solving SAT, and in particular for counting the number of satisfying assignments. And the standard hypothesis in this family is the non-deterministic exponential time hypothesis, which says that you can't do this. If you're shooting for informational theoretic samples. So it's a relatively mild assumption in the family, and it says that you can't uh, really count non deterministically <coughs> the number of satisfying assignments with, in time two to the epsilon n, where epsilon can be as small as you want. There are much crazier assumptions in this family. This is a mild one. And how, to, how are we breaking this hypothesis conditionally here? We're relaxing the soundness condition. The soundness of this NP type verifier isn't information theoretic. It's against adversaries running in time two to the O. Any questions about this statement other than the plausible assumption?
But we're going to revisit them. So if this isn't fully passed yet, you have you have another another chance. So how does this even relate to anything that I talked about, right? It was uh, like an argument system with one round for sharp set, unclear. So our context here is doubly efficient proof systems. So just recall, we're talking about the verifier and the prover talking to each other. And in the doubly efficient setting, the verifier, the verifier runs really, really fast. So in linear time, something practical. And the prover is still efficient. We're modeling real world scenarios. The prover isn't some more powerful thing, but it might be slower. It might run in quadratic time, cubic time, n to the 10. So it, it has an edge over the verifier, right? The verifier is weak, the prover is strong. And they're interacting over a common input names. This kind of doubly efficient interactive proof system has been studied a lot in the last decade. And we'll be interested in the question of de-randomizing such systems. So of course, this is a fine-grained question to start with. We're entirely in the polynomial time regime. We care about precise polynomial time bounds. And just introducing notations. So this is doubly efficient interactive proof, DEIP. See here is the number of messages. We're going to, we're going to meet this quantification. It seems to matter. And T is the running time of the verifier. So it's good to keep in mind the setting where T is linear or almost linear. Right? The verifier is very fast. And C is the number of messages. So you can think of uh, C over two rounds, where in each round two messages are exchanged. And just some assumptions. Uh, they're not truly without loss of generality, but all the protocols that I know satisfy them. So the, the two ones that I'm talking about is that it's a public coin system. So in every turn, the verifier just draws random coins and sends them to the prover. And the second one is that it has perfect completeness. So correct proofs or uh, correct claims are accepted with probability one. And the third assumption, which is just, it, this is not without loss of generality, this is the focus now, constantly many rounds in the system. Because this is the most natural setting in which you know how to be randomized with nice assumptions. And I'm going to define the new notion. The new notion is called the deterministic effective argument system. So I have no better way than to say it's a DE arg. Sounds funny, but it's an argument system with time t. So we have a verifier v that's deterministic and runs in time t. Again, think of t as very small, linear time or something like that. And there exists an efficient prover that can prove correct claims. The efficient here is polynomial t. And for every adversary that's efficient, the probability that the adversary manage, manages to find an input and a proof that for the verifier is negligible. Uh, this should be negligible in t. And of course, argument systems are, this isn't a new notion, the notion of argument systems. It's been studied since the, I remember the early 90s, but maybe before. But what is new here compared to the argument systems that have been studied mostly in cryptography for decades? There are two new things. First, the verifier is deterministic. So there's no interaction. It's an, an MP type argument system, just sending one message and the verifier checks it. And second is that the soundness condition in classical definitions held for every input, worst case inputs, and usually even for a non uniform uh, adversary. Here we are modeling real world situations a bit more uh, in a relaxed way. So we're talking about inputs that can be efficiently found. So you can think of it as a, an argument system that soundness holds on average, where on average means that over every distribution that can be efficiently sent. It's a really natural, natural <coughs> notion. Uh, we were surprised that it hasn't been defined before, at least uh, if you forget about the term. Is it related to this theater here type? Wow, well, we really wait like 10 slides. We're doing another type of theater. Because it sounds very, very similar. There you also go yeah. like randomness, you want to get rid of interaction. Right, but there you'll get two rounds with lots of randomness. Here you get really an MP type. In theater mirror, you start with the very fair. We will get to this in, in five minutes, but in Fiat Shamir, the verifier first chooses a hash function and sends it, and then the prover sends it. Here there's not <coughs> sends proof. So if you want like a, a loose association, think of it as like a universal hash function. But, you know, it's an overload of one. Practice. Sorry? Which is what they do. Precise, the exactly. 100%. There are a couple of more differences, but this is a great intuition. 
Okay, so having this definition in mind, this is the theorem under a plausible assumption that we're going to build together now. For every constant C, doubly efficient interactive proofs with C turns can be de-randomized into an NP-type argument system with basically no time of that. And you look at this and something crazy is going on. Because first of all, we, this doesn't depend on C. Even if you started with a proof system that has a million rounds, you completely kill it without paying for the number of rounds. The, there is basically no time overhead, regardless of how many rounds you sell. So like if, if your fingers are tickling, right? What you want to do is like to get a proof system, use a million rounds to speed up computation, and then just plug this. This is precisely what we can do. This is exactly what's going on. Where does the end on the right? Sorry? Where does C hurt us on the right? It, does um, it doesn't, but uh, well, it's hidden under the assumption that there are constant in any of this. If C is super constant, you're going to start paying for it in a more noticeable way. There is like a. So what's going wrong if you plug in it equals? Or... You are paying here something like n to the little o of C, like n to the C over on one. You are paying for it, but in the constant C regime, you can do not feel it. You're going to start feeling it where C goes to <coughs> so forget about uh, IP equals P space with uh, C equals N, the C equals log you are already there. But for now, when C is a constant and you can do a lot with the constant, then you don't feel it at all. And we removed randomness from the system. In particular, as a consequence, we removed all the interaction. So removing the randomness is stronger than removing the, the entire interaction, which is what's going to happen. There's no overhead regardless of the number of rounds. And what I talked about with sharp sat is just a special case. There's a proof system uh, shown by Williams, which just implements carefully the assumption protocol. There are a couple of tricks there that allows us to speed up sharp set by extending the number of rounds. So to count the number of satisfying solutions, you take more and more rounds, like something like one over epsilon. Then you can do it in time two to the epsilon n. They're just plugging this result. You get an argument system that runs in time two to the epsilon. <coughs> the rest of the talk is a proof sketch. So if you have questions, this will be the time. Good. Um, well, I'm going to show one special case, which showcases the main ideas. The special cases are okay, the very fair runs in time t. You can think of t as linear if you want. The number of random bits is, uh, and think of it as in the medium range. It's not t, it's not sublogarithmic, it's like n to the little of one. We can justify this uh, assumption by making some hardness assumption, but I, I just want to treat the special, special case now. That's the most interesting one. And it has perfect components. So this is the setting to keep in mind. We want to randomize this. And it suffices for sharp set, because the sharp set proof system has all these problems. So we're going to start with a targeted PRG. I'm going to show a very simple construction of a targeted PRG, probably the simplest that we have. It's based only on old technical tools, just for interpreting them. And we're going to then use this targeted PRG for the randomization. So fix some parameters. R is the number of random coins. K is proportional to R, a bit larger, but think of it as similar to R. Delta is as small as you want. And our assumption is that, that there exists a function that acts as follows. The function takes t bits and it outputs k bits. k is small, remember, like the number of random coins, which is proportional to k, it's n to the little of one. So it's really shrinking a lot. And our assumption about this function is that the mapping of an input and an input, like to output each bit of the function, you can do it in a certain time bound that's very close to t. So we have an efficient way to output individual bits of this function. And jumping ahead, this isn't necessary for the construction, but it's instructive to keep in mind. What we will assume about this function later is that it's hard to print the entire string in time that is very close to the time that it takes to output one of it. This, this is actually supernatural. This is what you get in direct product kind of results. A function such a, like, think of a maximally hard function, okay, which satisfies the stronger, direct, strongest direct product theorem that you want. So, you pay time t prime to output one bit, 
And to output k, it's you need to pay time t prime times k, just paying multiplicatively in the um, multiplicatively in the number of things. You can say that by some sort of batch computation. The, 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 there are <coughs> such functions, it's a reasonable assumption. This is much milder. We're going to assume that it's hard to print the entire k bit string in time that's very, very close to the time that it takes to output just one. So you can't batch compute it in some very clever. Okay, but for now, let's forget about the hardness assumption. We just have this assumption that individual bits can be computed in time close to t. And the lemma is that there exists a targeted PRG mapping t bits to a list of strings, strings of length r. So this is the pseudo random set. It works very quickly in time close to t. And it satisfies something that's analogous to, stand, to classical reconstruction algorithms. Reconstruction algorithms tells us, okay, if there is a distinguisher for the pseudo random set, then we can compute the hard function. This is a one on one, one on one textbook set. You can take a distinguisher and transform it to something that computes the hard function. And since the latter doesn't exist, there is no distinguisher. But the difference here is that it's a targeted PRG, which means that it depends on the particular input. So we have a probabilistic reconstruction algorithm rec, that satisfies the following condition. For every fixed Z, Z is the T-bit input to the targeted PRG. If the output of the targeted PRG in Z doesn't fool the distinguisher, when the distinguisher also sees Z, then the reconstruction computes the hard function on the same input set. Computes the hard function here means printing the entire string too quickly. So this is just as in the classical result. You take someone that breaks a PRG and you create someone that computes the hard function, <coughs> except that here all of the players are getting the same auxiliary input, Z. The PRG is with respect to Z, the distinguisher works when it sees Z, and the reconstruction computes the hard function on this particular Z. How do we do this? Still good for time. So, okay, we have Z, right? This is our input. And we have a hard function. So what are you going to do, right? Just compute the hard function on Z. That's the naive thing to do here. We compute it, we have K bits. And just apply the classical stuff. Take F of Z, think of it as a truth table of a hard function. So it's just something, it's a string of K bits that you produce from Z, but now think of it as a truth table of a hard function and apply the standard in some video system that you know. And there's a, a lemma about this uh, standard is some some stuff that's so old that it's from 98 that you can transform a distinguisher to a circuit whose truth table is f of z very efficiently uniformly and if i have such a circuit then i can easily print f of z so this looks perfect except for the one fact that this transformation needs to read a few bits of it and it's not clear how to get these bits to the transformation and this is where our assumption comes in. This is just one simple idea underlying this construction, that you can answer the queries of this old algorithm by explicitly computing the bits. That was our assumption, that F is such that you can quickly compute each of its output bits. So how will the reconstruction work? Well, how do we print the entire string? We assume that we have a distinguisher. We run the old reconstruction algorithm and whenever the reconstruction algorithm asks to get a bit of f of z, we compute it explicitly. We have z in our hands. We can do it, and we have the assumption that bits of f of z are quickly computable. And in the end, it gives us a circuit, and we evaluate the circuit on all its inputs and then we can print f of z. And I know that I'm rushing a bit. So the bottom line is that for every fixed z, <coughs> If the reconstruction with the distinguisher fails to print f of z, then the targeted PRG works on this input set. So the hardness assumption will be that the reconstruction with a certain distinguisher fails to print f of z, and the conclusion would be that the targeted PRG works with this particular. I know it was a bit fast, especially if you haven't seen this type of reconstruction argument before. Are there any questions before I move on to the second part of the proof? Yeah. 
question about the uh, distinguisher. Is this like for a fixed distinguisher in this works or like for any distinguisher? For any, yeah. Oh. So it's, you think of the, this is a black box with respect to distinguisher. So for every function V, the case it is it. Right. So again, what's going on here is that we have a construction of a targeted PRG. And for every fixed Z, when it's hard to print the function on this Z, the targeted PRG works in this particular Z. It's instance wise. There are tons of technical caveats. I'm lying a bit, I'm hiding details just to make this as clean as I can. This doesn't work as is, but it's close enough to react. So what do we do? We have this targeted PRG on our hands. And we have this protocol that we run to the randomize. The verifier sends random coins, gets a proof, sends random coins, gets a proof, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And a first misguided attempt would be to apply the PRG to the input. That's what we do with targeted PRGs, we apply them to the input. But this doesn't make sense, it doesn't work here. Because look at round three. In round three, we're going to replace the random coins by pseudo random ones. But the test at that point of whether or not the coins are pseudo random doesn't depend only on the input. It depends on the entire transaction of what happened up to that point. The prover and the verifier had a full conversation. The quality of the random coins depends on that conversation. So the natural idea is to use the targeted PRG in each turn with the transcript as the hard input. This is precisely what's going on in Fiat so in every turn, we're going to look at the transcript of the conversation that happened up to that turn. Think of it as a hard input to the targeted PRG and run the targeted PRG with that. This is how the pseudo randomness looks. So in each turn, we, instead of random coins, we have pseudo random coins that were generated by applying a supposedly hard function to the transcript and then doing classical assembly, just the type of stuff. And if you look at it, it for a second, it looks alarming. Why should it work? The function might be hard, but you know, it's going to be easy on some inputs, especially with the parameter setting that we now have in mind. It, it's reasonable that it will, be, it will be easy on some inputs. So maybe they're rare, but they exist, in which case the targeted PRG won't work, because on those transcripts, the function is easy. So the punchline here is that when the prover is efficient, the transcript in each round comes from an efficiently sampleable distribution, a conversation between two efficient uh, parties. So if we are going to assume that F is hard with high probability over inputs that come from every polynomial time sampleable distribution, this means that with high probability, the transcript is going to be hard. And the targeted PRG will work in each so the assumptions that we're going to need about F are that it's easy to compute each bit of F, but it's hard to print the entire string F of Z with high probability when Z is sampled for many polynomial times on distribution. This shrinks the number of random coins and allows us to collapse the protocol and rushing through this. This is standard. And the digest of what we saw is a very simple construction of a targeted PRG applying this targeted PRG of the transcript in each turn as a source of hardness to get pseudo randomness, and that when the uh, prover is efficient, the transcript comes from an efficiently sampled distribution. It suffices to get a nice uniform hardness assumption. This is the formal statement of the result. I'm wondering, I think we're out of time. So despite the fact that I promised to pass this, maybe we can do it afterwards. But this is precisely formalizing what we just said. If F is easy, it's easy to compute individual bits of it, but hard to print it in its entirety over every polynomial time sample distribution, then you can de-randomize interactive proofs without paying for the number of rounds, NP type parameters. Uh, the assumption is quite plausible. You can talk about it if you want. We got just going to mention takeaways very briefly. So zooming out going away from the particular proof and result that I just talk, talked about, we have a non-black box version of hardness versus randomness. It's a revision of the classical ones. It has many instantiations and several new constructions of targeted PRGs, works well. Uh, the way of thinking in the last couple of years about how to do the randomization avoids these classical PRGs. It goes totally in the targeted way. 
We have questions about super fast randomization algorithms and free lunch, removing randomness without paying for it at all, and several results indicating that this may be true. The directions are distinct. Each of them has questions that, is, that are interesting regardless of the other direction, but there's also an inherent relation. When you want to go to free lunch theorems, you need non-black box theorems. And a couple of very carefully pruned open questions. So as I said, there's a major conjecture that's unproved about the equivalence of randomization to something uniform and very natural and clean. Be glad to talk about it. These free lunch theorems, we don't know if this uh, these non non batch computability direct product kind of hypothesis are necessary. So it's interesting to show either direction, either that they are necessary or theorems under weaker stuff. Uh, we have very mild evidence, like in some restricted settings, they're necessary. The settings are quite restricted. And something that's particular to the result that we just saw, just to this particular result, I, did, I presented a new notion, right? Argument systems that work on average. If it's supernatural, it should be explored on its own right. If you're interested, there's a workshop on this in Fox. There's a great panel <coughs> of speakers. Please join if you're there. Um, both in my website and in EGS website, we have uh, tons of available papers, slide decks from talks. We have nice diagrams and pictures. We use ticks across the board. I invite you to take a look. And we also like email, so please feel more than welcome to just send me an email if you're curious. That's it. Thank you very much for listening. So, do you, do you get any unconditional upper bound that something that looks like it should be true is false? Or at least one of two things? No. Like yes. too far, can you use it to speed up sharp side with some model? Or? Well, that's going back. So, basically, asking about this slide, right? Yeah. So actually, this can even be true if you change two to the epsilon n to polynomial time. It breaks down. <coughs> we don't know how to prove it, but it's possible that it's possible to even prove it in this way. It doesn't break any th. It doesn't break any of the sample assumptions. Well, by an but in an argument system, not in an empty type system. That's the difference. So any TH from the exponential time hypothesis family tells you that you cannot do such a thing when the soundness is information per work. But here you are paying something. The soundness is only against efficient efforts. This is what allows us to bypass this exponential time hypothesis and get very, very fast. Thank you. Try to do sharp stuff and then be used. This is consistent with sharp set requiring exponential. This is consistent with sharp set requiring time, you know, the strong exponential time. Requiring time. Non deterministic. Yeah. Requiring time 2 to the 1 minus epsilon n. This is consistent with that. What this demonstrate to you, demonstrates to you, like what I learned from this, is that by relaxing the soundness to be computational, you can get an amazing story. So, because B is still allowed for exponential time. Yeah. So this is basically kind of like a yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. If you have in mind like a Killian's argument system for NP, where you can prove any NP statement in polylog, that would be kind of analogous to this thing with a polynomial running. Except that this thing is not in Killian with four rounds of interaction. This is just one NP type message, no interaction. Uh, those limits on Fiat Shamir from cryptographers do they teach us here? Yeah. So there are those results, like annoying results. Yeah. Basically, I think everyone kind of in practice uses Fiat Shamir, but you can construct as it. Uh, well, like, we don't know how to apply the, the formal limitations of Fiat Shamir to this thing. However, I can convince you that the same kinds of limitations hold in this case. And what do they say here? That you cannot uh, de randomize an argument system in this way. You start with an argument system. But you need to start with a proof system and end up with an argument system. You don't start with an argument system and end up with another argument system.
but it's true that fiat shomir there are also limitations to general proof systems and we're not sure whether they're important these are great questions um, there's similarity and difference between this thing and Fiat Shamir. The similarity is over. I'm sorry, there's an entire dialogue about Fiat Shamir. Fiat Shamir does the same thing with hash function from the 80s. But we only know that it works in uh, restricted cases. So uh, the similarity is obvious. The difference is that, again, here you're deterministic, of course, but there's another crucial difference. In Fiat Shamir, you're just using the hash function. So it's the simplest thing you can think of, right? Some linear time, whatever. Here you're using a hard function, necessarily. So you're going to increase everybody's running time. And that turns out to be really important. Even if the increase is minor. Any questions? Thanks. Thank you very much.